So the way that gravitational wave detectors detect gravitational waves is by measuring the light travel time between a laser and a mirror. And the mirror is usually some kilometers away. So there's two things we have to do to make this gravitational wave detector work at the level of sensitivity that's needed. And let me say, what is that level of sensitivity? What we're trying to do is we're measuring the displacements of mirrors that are kilometers apart. And those displacements are at the level of 10 to the minus 18 meters. So this is not terribly easy to do. And so one piece of the, of the enormous technologies involved in LIGO are making the, the mirror very still, so you know, uh, shielding it from all, the, all external forces like seismic noise and, and thermal noise. And another piece of the work that we must do is to make a measurement of, that, of the position of the mirror at that level of sensitivity. The measurement tool in our case is the laser light itself. It is the laser light and the wavelength of light that acts as the meter stick by which we measure these small displacements. So the way that the LIGO measurement works is we shine laser light in an, into an interferometer. And so the, the interferometer basically works by splitting the laser light in two orthogonal parts, two paths that are 90 degrees to each other. The light travels for four kilometers, and it returns to the beam splitter, and it interferes there. And we measure that interference pattern. If, and we can arrange the path lengths to such that the interference pattern can be completely constructive or completely destructive. So that's the principle of the, of the measurement. Now, one of the big limits to how well you can do comes to us from quantum mechanics. It, you know, we know that light is quantized. And the quantization of light puts a limit on how precisely we can measure the mirror position. So one easy way, this is called the shot noise limit. And what it, one easy way to, to think about it is it comes about because of the Heisenberg uncertainty principle. So we know from the Heisenberg uncertainty principle that we can't measure two complementary variables with, with uh, inf infinite precision. And so the way that the quantization of light interferes with our measurement is simply that our, me our signal is, is proportional to the number of photons, to the amount of light that we have hitting the mirror. So the more photons we, we can count, the more uh, signal we have. Now, the noise, the quantum noise on the light, it's a Poisson distributed um, noise source. And so the noise goes as the square root of the number of photons, or the square root of the power. So you can immediately see that our signal increases with power. Our noise increases with square root of power. So the signal to noise ratio improves with increasing the laser power. And that's a trick that is commonly played in, in, in optical measurements, where you try to use more uh, uh, laser power to make a better measurement. Now, it turns out that there is another um, price to be paid when you do that in a gravitational wave detector. Now, for the, the mirror to, to displace under the influence of a gravitational wave, we suspend it as a pendulum, so it's a quasi-free particle. So now you can think about, about it this way. We have a mirror <laughs> that's hanging from a pendulum, and its natural frequency is about 1 hertz. So if you just pull the mirror and let it swing, it would swing at 1 hertz. So at frequencies well above 1 hertz, this is a, a quasi-free particle. It, it will respond freely to the forces uh, uh, that, that push on it. Now, it turns out, of course, that these, these very same photons that have their fluctuating quantum noise that gives us the square root of, of, of power relationship, these very same photons also carry momentum. And now that momentum, when the photon hits the mirror, it exchanges momentum with the mirror, and it kicks the mirror. So in LIGO, we have this very incredible and rather fundamental quantum noise limit which is that we would like to use more laser power to make a better measurement to, get, to do better than the shot noise limit. But when we use more laser power, that our, the, the momentum of the photons kicks the mirror. So the very 
act of making the measurement is disturbing the measurement. And this is sometimes called the quantum measurement problem or the quantum noise uh, uh, problem. And it turns out that in our field, and it, we also have something we call the standard quantum limit, which is where these two competing effects equate. So it's a rather fundamental question. Actually, you could ask about more or less any measurement, which is, if I use light to measure the position of a particle, how well can I do? And the answer is, it's limited by the Heisenberg uncertainty principle for this exact reason. If you use more light to make a, a stronger measurement, you get a stronger back action, which is that your measurement kicks the particle. And so we, in our laboratories, also do research on that question of, of how do we make detections that can do better than this standard quantum limit or, or exceed it. And to do that, there, you need techniques that always always honor the Heisenberg uncertainty principle, because that is, is, is a, you know, it's a fundamental law of nature, but we can manipulate it. So we like to think of, of this as, as we, we get to, to play with the Heisenberg uncertainty principle, and our research uh, it allows us to do that. So let me now talk about one piece of this quantum noise problem, which was the shot noise problem. Where does the shot noise come from, and how can we do better? So the way, let's think of a very simple thought experiment. The thought experiment is that I have a simple Michelson interferometer that some of you will be familiar from with the Michelson-Morley experiment. It's a device where you start with a laser beam. You split the laser beam in exactly a half on a beam splitter. Half the light gets reflected by the beam splitter. Half the light gets transmitted by the beam splitter. And then you have two mirrors that reflect the light back to the beam splitter. And by arranging the path length between the mirrors and the beam splitter, of course, you can make perfect destructive or constructive interference at the output. Now suppose for a moment that I arrange these path lengths so I make perfect destructive interference at the output. Right? That means. In the ideal case, no light goes to the output. And by conservation of energy, all the light has to go back to the laser. So now let me, let me uh, frame the, 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 the thought experiment question. Where does the noise that comes with the laser go? Now, of course, if the noise is, is simply attached to the laser light, then it should all go right back to the laser. And if I now put a detector at the output port that is the other side of the beam splitter, not the, the laser side, I should measure a perfect nothing. right? The, uh, the truth is we don't. It turns out that in, in the quantum mechanical formulation of this problem, our, our interferometer is, is surrounded by all the, uh, the uh, modes of the electromagnetic vacuum. And where do these come from? These come simply from, from uh, you know, spontaneous creation and annihilation of virtual particles. So the way that I like to think of, of, of the quantum mechanical world is no matter where we are, we are surrounded by this popcorn of vacuum states, which is just uh, part particle, virtual particles being, being created and annihilated. So this output port of our beam splitter is a natural place where these vacuum fluctuations enter the, the interferometer. And by the symmetry of the beam splitter, the vacuum fluctuations come right back out. So now, if I make this measurement, even this idealized measurement where all my laser noise went back to the laser, when I measure any signal coming out due to the relative displacements of the mirrors, that signal has to beat with this vacuum fluctuations that have also traveled in the interferometer. And that's where the shot noise comes from. The shot noise comes from the vacuum fluctuations superposing on the light, the signal carry, uh, light coming out of the interferometer. And this was an idea that was introduced in the very early 1980s by Carl Caves and, and, and collaborators. And it's a very important distinction to understand if we want to now do better. Because if you believe all the noise came with the laser light, then you'd spend all your time making a better and better laser. But that noise all goes back to the laser and doesn't really help your measurement if you're truly limited by this quantum noise. 
So what we have done in our laboratories, and, and we're certainly not the first to, 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 to do this, is we have created uh, what are called squeezed states of light. So let's talk about squeezed states. What are these? So let's start with, an, uh, with an, a, a classical um, uh, a, a state of light. The classical state of light simply says that you have some uh, light wave. It's, it has an amplitude and a phase, as any wave does. Now, in quantum mechanics, we also have to uh, impose the Heisenberg uncertainty principle. And what the Heisenberg uncertainty principle says about light is that we can't know the amplitude and phase of the light uh, perfectly well at any given time. In fact, they are uncertain. the product of their uncertainties is, is, is given by the Heisenberg limit. And so what we have done in our laboratories is to create a squeeze state of light where we take the uncertainty in the amplitude or the phase, and we make it smaller than the shot noise limit. But of course, that would violate Heisenberg if that was all we did. We have to, at the same time as we make the, the uncertainty in the amplitude smaller, we must make the uncertainty in the phase bigger so that the product is still uh, the same as what Heisenberg would require. The product still gives us h bar. And that's what we do. We have experiments in our laboratories where we can create these squeeze states of light using nonlinear interactions in optical materials. And we have actually shown that when you inject these squeeze states of light into the LIGO interferometers, you can make the, uh, you can improve the signal to noise ratio to better than the shot noise limit. And that's very exciting, because now what we can do is we can use these specially quantum engineered states of light to make a measurement that, is, that does better than the shot noise limit. Squeeze states of light were proposed in the early 1980s uh, by Caves and collaborators. The very first squeeze states were made in 1985 uh, by Slusher et al. And it has taken us almost 20 years more to make them work in gravitational wave detectors in, in a useful way. And the reason for this is that squeeze states are actually very fragile. So when you create a squeeze state, first of all, to create a squeeze state, you need, you need to have uh, these nonlinear interactions, which are usually not very strong. So you don't create a very strongly squeeze state to begin with. But then the squeeze state very easily uh, wants to degrade back to the vacuum state. So every time in your optical system you encounter an optical loss, you know, your squeeze state mixes with the ordinary vacuum state and wants to degrade back to the ordinary vacuum state. So once you generate the squeeze state, delivering it with very little, as little loss as possible to the interferometer is one of the big challenges uh, in, in, in these experiments. Is how do you create a, a squeeze state that's very, very squeezed, more squeezing we would like, and then how do you maintain that degree of squeezing as the squeeze state travels in your optical system to the interferometer and back to the detection? Uh, port. So that's one of the big challenges in, in squeeze state generation is making enough squeezing and then preserving that, squ uh, that squeeze state uh, in our experiments. Another thing that's very difficult to do and something that's actually a topic of active research in our group right now is how to make a squeeze state um, where at different frequencies, you're squeezing either the amplitude or the phase degrees of freedom. Now, why would we like to do that? Well, it turns out that in, the, in gravitational wave detectors, we are at high frequencies. We're limited by the shot noise on the phase fluctuations. But at low frequencies, our, where our mirror responds more easily to external forces, we're limited by that, that, that momentum transfer, the radiation pressure noise. And so we would like to be able to make a squeeze state where at high frequencies we're squeezing along one axis, and at low frequencies we're squeezing along the opposite axis, and at intermediate frequencies we have, you know, so we'd like to have a continuously rotating squee uh, uh, squeeze state. And that's another thing that we are working on in our laboratories right now. And to do that, we are 
using these devices that are called uh, optical cavities, and they are used to continuously rotate the squeeze state. 